Back to the Future. That's a cool name. It uh, might remind you of the movie, and it kind of is intended to do that. Um, but today, um, it's more about this. When a project is started, um, you, uh, we try to make it as good as we can with the technologies that are at hand uh, at the time. And we are proud of what we've achieved, and we've made something great. And then time passes, and what used to be awesome becomes obsolete. And if we do not upgrade, refactor, uh, rethink our architecture, we become stuck. If we would have never created the integrated circuit, we'll be here a large phone to carry around. So we did the same uh, here at Ahold for Uppy, uh, our iPhone app, the first version of it. Uh, is shown here on a legacy iPhone as well, the 4, I think, yeah. And the first version was released uh, in 2009. Um, it was one of the first iPhone apps, I think the first for supermarkets. Um, later on, they decided, we decided, that we wanted to have a tablet app as well. Um, and to do that, uh, one of the reasons to do that was because the uh, iPhone app code base had become rather cluttered, as a project does uh, in, what is it, three years. Um, so we uh, reused all the parts that are still usable, in our opinion, and designed a new UI on top of that uh, for iPad. Um, so it's still based on the code base from 2009. Then later on, uh, to get rid of even more of the old code, the iPad app is upgraded to a universal app. So both iPhone and, uh, and iPad, and we called it Appy 2.0 uh, in 2014. And then later on, um, well, as it goes with apps, it was again obsolete. And we, run, uh, we ran into more and more issues. I'm sure you've all been there. It becomes tedious. It becomes annoying, it becomes uh, hard to work with, lots of bugs. Um, so something needs to be done. We need to rethink our architecture, we need to upgrade. So what were the problems? Um, well, this wasn't necessarily the problem, this is just the way the app looked. Uh, the iPad app on the left, we had a very nice custom navigation, meaning uh, a regular uh, iOS navigation goes from left to right, or from right to left. If you click on something, it slides in from the, from the right. Obviously, that wasn't special enough. So we had a top-down navigation, custom. Um, as you can see with the chevron on top. So new pages would slide in from the bottom. Is that true? Yeah, I think it is. And then when you press back, it goes down and you go back to the page above. The navigation bar would stick so it wouldn't move at all, just the title would change and the image that's there, which is very custom as well. And on iPhone, we had something, uh, we had the same initially, but we decided to do it differently. So we had a navigation bar at the bottom, um, which was context aware, meaning um, the, the hamburger button on the left and the list button on the right would always be there, almost always, um, and have the same function, but the button in the middle, the blue one, uh, was context uh, related. So usually it's a search button, but for example, on the product details page, it becomes uh, the quantity control. So for adding and removing groceries uh, from the list. Uh, very custom and slightly difficult, uh, slightly, well, more difficult than standard navigation to maintain and to build. We ran into some issues with that. So those were some examples. This is a more extensive list. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice list. So the past, uh, it was good at the time. It was Objective-C. It was all there was. And Objective-C was, well, not bad, but it was Objective-C. Um, so we wanted to go with the flow. Swift had become mature enough, at least, to implement. So we wanted to go to Swift. It would be harder and harder to find Objective-C developers. So there are plenty of reasons to, uh, to make the switch. On top of that, we had some architectural, uh, well, how do you say? <laughs> we had some things we wanted to change. So for example, uh, the app was based 
on one God framework um, that was completely custom and pretty much only used by our company. Um, the reason for it was very simple and logical. Back in the day, 2009, when the first uh, version of the app was created and released, a lot of features that are very common now in UIKit and in iOS were just not present. There was no uh, AF networking, uh, lots of basic stuff from UIKit was missing. So we had a custom framework that did all that. And that's nice, except that now it's not so nice anymore. And there are much better solutions uh, that are both open source, which means they are maintained by other people uh, and tested by other people. So it's much more likely that it works. Um, much, le uh, m uh, yeah, much less bugs to fix. Um, so what used to be a good idea became uh, a bad idea actually in time. On top of that, we had created a God UI view controller. Um, to explain the word God here, God is all-knowing, almighty, all-seeing. It's nice for God. It's not good in a UI view controller <laughs> to have one view controller that does and knows everything, as you will probably know. Because what do you get? You get uh, yeah, tangled code, enormous, um, enormous files. For example, Let's see, how do I start the... No, that's not it. I have a video. There you go. That's one file. There's more, still more, still more, still more. And that's it. So that is too much. That's one class. It's like 5,000 lines of code? Uh, well, the, the lines of code were not that many, actually. I checked. I was hoping for a large number. That's why I didn't show it here. <laughs> it's only 1,000. <laughs> But uh, lots of, well, you know, if you see this, you would expect more, right? I was disappointed. Um, there are, however, also some categories that extend this class, which are not shown here. So it's big. It's way too big. It does everything. It does data loading. It has some navigation logic, um, popover logic. I don't even know anymore. But way too much. It did everything. So every time uh, a new functionality was desired in one, more than one view controller, it was added here. It was the um, subclass point, so the parent of all view controllers. On the bottom left, I've shown, uh, well, it is the worst one, but an example of inheritance. So it's about the AHT, AHT, my list view controller, which is the list view controller, so where you have your grocery shopping list which descends from shopping list items table view controller, which descends from table view controller, our own table view controller, which descends from backplate aware view controller. The backplate is the image you saw on top in the navigation, so it's an image that stays in, uh, in view, which then descends for the God class, uh, AHT uh, view controller, and then we had one more in between, which was legacy from the first version of the app, it was, which was still adding. So, not so good. And then came the UI, uh, UI kit stuff. Uh, so yeah, inheritance, many layers of inheritance. Um, this caused the code to be very tangled as well, um, especially with the subclassing. So there was functionality being added by sub, uh, subclasses, but of course, sometimes the parent will have some functionality that's undesired. So you get Booleans to disable that bit. And it becomes very difficult to predict what's going to happen uh, very, very fast. So. Um, on top of that, the code was very tangled as well as uh, not so much in inheritance only, but also because of uh, data loading, for example, was tangled in view controllers. So the services, the network layer was tangled hard without protocols or anything. It was a mess. It worked, but bugs were very difficult to find. On top of that, um, because it's a large project, large company, so you want some automatic testing to kind of guarantee that it will work when you release it. But the code was never made for testing. So you can't write a unit test for code that was never made for testing. Well, you can, but not so much. Um, so we had black box testing using Calabash, which is pretty much automated clicking through the app. I'm not sure if anyone has any experience with it, but it breaks. It breaks, it breaks a lot. Um, on top of that, we also did not really mock away the network layer. So you also have server issues, like, oh, they changed the name of the product. 
and 15 tests fail. Um, so we had that. On top of that, <laughs> we had aspect-oriented programming, which is a, uh, a nice name for swizzling. <laughs> yep, so we did that. Um, I'm gonna name one example, the, the navigation view, the, the bottom navigation view you see. Um, in order to update the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom button, <laughs> We had a swizzle on the UI view controller view did appear function, which is triggered a lot. Uh, and when that was triggered, we would send an update automatically. So instead of just calling a, a set needs layout like function, uh, we would just do it on every view will appear for every view controller. Don't try to do it, it doesn't go well. Um, but we're learning. Um, Associated objects, I didn't know what it was before I came here, but it means that you add variables to a class in a protocol. So it's a hack. It's a hack that, uh, well, pretty much you, you call some C functions to add stuff to a class that shouldn't be there. It kind of works, but it's nasty. Uh, yeah, we had the custom exotic navigation that I talked about. Uh, oh yeah, and we fitted it in the standard UI kit component. So we had a very exotic navigation, but we kind of hacked it into the UI navigation controller. Yeah, I could go on for a while about that. Um, and a minor one, but still, um, we had some custom components, of course, buttons, which also had a lot of inheritance, but we configured them within the class. So instead of just setting the color to this and the title to that and the, the highlighted state to this, we had a set type and then an enumerated value. So for example, login button or uh, checkout button or whatever, and then it would configure itself. But that list grows and grows and grows and it becomes very nasty. It's a relatively small thing, but still. Uh, so the revelation, at some point we were tired <laughs> of the mess. We came together, we had what we called uh, a code retro, retrospective. Retrospective is from uh, the Scrum uh, methodology where you look back on the previous sprint and you try to learn from uh, what you've done. We did this for our code base. So not so much the process, but the code base. Um, and we came with a sort of manifesto on the left. Um, pretty much summarizing the things that we did not like about the way we were working and possible solutions that we wanted to at least try out. Um, and on, additionally, the, the testing needed to be improved because the, maintaining Calabash was very time consuming and um, not really worth the effort because very little actual bugs were caught by this system and it took up a lot of time and it was annoying time, uh, no, annoying work. And it was built in Ruby. We don't know Ruby, we are iOS developers. <laughs> so we wanted to get rid of that as well and we wanted to turn the pyramid upside down because we were, we were at the top uh, mostly with our tests. We had only GUI user interface tests, so the Calabash click-through thing. While it's much better to have unit tests because it's much more solid, much easier to maintain. Um, and um, um, yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, on top of the UI tests, we also did snapshot, snapshot tests, meaning if you have a custom UI component or whatever, uh, in the test you configure it and then you take a screenshot pretty much of just a component and then you can do that every time and if the screenshots match, pixel based, then it's good. And if you change something so it goes all skewed or whatever, it's not good. <laughs> so it's a visual test really. Um, that part worked very well and we, uh, we kept that around. When we were designing the future, our new future, as there is always a new future on the horizon. Um, so what did we want? Swift, obviously. Uh, I think we got in around Swift 3.0, which I think was a good point to get in. It was the last major breaking change, the migration from the Swift 2 to 3. Still some things are changing, but the migration from two to three was tedious, I think. 
but we only got in after. Um, instead of the custom God framework, we wanted to use proven uh, open source frameworks, as I said. Um, extendable and slim, small UI view controllers. So instead of having the one God class, it would be extendable using protocols and default implementations, which is a very nice uh, Swift structure. Uh, a composite uh, methodology, methodology instead of inheritance. So uh, yeah, don't, don't stack it, but put it beside each other, helpers, um, protocols with default implementation, stuff like that. Untangled code, obviously. Uh, so unit tests, snapshot tests, um, more standard iOS patterns and UI kit patterns. Well, it's pretty much the opposite of what I just said. So add variables through protocols. We have decided to go for a standard-ish navigation. So as you can see on the screenshot, it's uh, a tab bar navigation. Um, and we have uh, also, of course, a stack navigation. So like UI uh, navigation controller. But we did create a custom implementation, implementation. And the reason for that is not so much in this image, but when we just started, we still had the, the backplate thing going on. And that was still the design that we wanted. Uh, hacking it into the standard UI kit uh, classes seemed like a worse idea than making it yourself, even though obviously then you have to maintain it yourself. But so far, once you get over the first hurdle, it's actually very nice because you know there's always designers uh, in your team and they always have fancy ideas, which look really good on paper, I have to say, but can be a horror to implement. And sometimes you have to, of course, put the brakes on. But sometimes it's just a good idea. And if you have your custom navigation classes that are pretty much like the original as well in functionality as API wise, but they are your own non-closed code. It's very easy to add some nice functionality without going uh, through all the hacky bits. So we decided to do that. Um, and yeah, our components, our views are now configured with properties instead of an e number. So it's just a button uh, and you can set the background color, you can set the title, you can set if it has rounded corners, whatever. Uh, and in order to uh, reuse styles, we have a factory, which is pretty much the same thing. So uh, that's how you create your default buttons. Uh, so this is all still theory. How do we do it? Bam! I think this speaks for itself. Um, there were two parts that needed to be designed. The first was the network layer the data layer, which is on the left of the dotted line. And the second was the UI layer. Um, as said, we didn't want to use the God custom framework anymore. We wanted to use open source. So we decided to go with Moya. And Moya is uh, a framework that's actually uh, a wrapper around a Lamofire, which is, I think everybody knows a Lamofire. It's well tested, well used, everyone uses it. And Moya is just a shell around it. Uh, and the main reason is that uh, if you use a LAMO fire, usually the tendency is to just create one large network call manager that has all the calls in there. Uh, you don't have to do it like that, obviously, but that's kind of what happens if you don't look out. And Moya uh, adds a nice swifty way to do it with an enumeration style uh, request. So uh, each request is an enumera enumeration uh, case uh, with a function to get, create a request and the, uh, well it's a little bit difficult to explain without an example but it's nice and it makes it easier to split uh, all the calls you want to do into separate uh, files so for each server that you call you have one service object and then on top of that you have worker objects and a worker object is pretty much just the one function for one request which wraps it uh, with a closure a completion block a failure block pretty much the same as a Lamofier, but it's nicely compartmentalized and it's cancelable. Um, and that's pretty much the data layer, so it's pretty easy. Then on top of that, the main thing uh, is for uh, the UI bit. We researched a number of ways to do it. And the main problem we saw was the, uh, the massive view controller problem. Um, when we follow Apple's example, uh, the way they usually in their examples and uh, uh, example code create view controllers, it's that the view controller does everything. 
Uh, and then there's, there's, there's some views that, that uh, the visual aspect of it, but the view controller tends to become very large. It does data handling, it does view, view handling, um, everything really that's necessary for that one view. Uh, you can implement some stuff in business logic, but still there's a lot going around in the view controller. It's difficult to test because it's all private, it's all in there. So there are several ways to break it up. Um, one of the ways is MVVM, one is Viper, um, and we, in the end, there are many more, obviously, probably, we uh, ended up using CleanSwift, uh, which is also uh, abbreviated VIP, which stands for View Interactor Presenter, uh, and there's a router as well. It's, it sounds very much like Viper, but it's slightly different, because where Viper goes back and forth, CleanSwift only goes in a circle. So, what happens? Let's start with the VC, the view controller. Um, the view controller controls views, as it should. It's the data source for table views. It's the data source for uh, collection views. It handles tabs, uh, gestures, um, and all that, visual aspects of the view. If an interaction takes place, um, that is immediately forwarded to the interactor for interactions. Um, the interactor is pretty much the brains of, uh, of the operation. Um, it will decide on its, based on its internal state and um, the interaction that has occurred, what needs to be done. And this can be uh, something internally with business logic. Uh, we had business logic like the list manager, which does synchronization of the list and uh, it stores uh, the order list and uh, the normal shopping list for going to the shop. Um, but it can also fire network requests, etc. Uh, whenever an event happens, like a request has finished or some other event that was never really triggered by the interactor, but it's just an app-wide event or whatever, the interactor can react to that. And usually it will result in something needing to be presented. So the interactor will take the raw data model from the server or from whatever object the event has come, send it to the presenter. Uh, the presenter is stateless, it will only uh, convert the, the raw data to a view model. The view model is a series of objects, ideally one object with other objects in it, um, that only consists of primitive types, so only strings, integers, booleans, stuff like that. No dates, no complex um, objects that still need to be formatted, like string formatting is done in the presenter and it's all presented, ready to go to the view controller. Uh, the view controller will store it, show it, update table views, whatever. Using, in our case, we have a style guide, we have the view factory I talked about, there's a color guide, the font style guide, all that stuff to normalize, uh, uh, yeah, to have reusable styling in the app. So kind of like style sheets for the web, but uh, for iOS. Then there's one strange one, the R for router, which is dangling at the bottom a little bit, uh, and it's kind of a mix between the view and the interactor. What happens is in the view controller, uh, for example, if you have a, a list of products and you want to see the details of the products, it's an interaction, but it's an interaction that's supposed to trigger routing. So instead of going to the interactor, the view controller will handle the call to the router because it's a view kind of thing. It's a bit messy, but yeah, we thought about it, and this is really we think the best way to do it, as well for testability. It will trigger routing, uh, and because uh, for routing usually you will need some IDs or some raw data, there's a small line to the interactor, which is called the data store line, not so much interactor, to retrieve raw data that's required to forward to the next view. Um, and that's pretty much the circle. Uh, yes, a question? Is the router specific to the view controller, or do you have one for? Specific. Uh, this set here is, uh, is called a, a scene. Um, it, it pretty much encompasses a page usually, but it could also be a, like a subview controller, a small component that's uh, managed. Uh, and each, uh, each, each scene has all these, well, the, the view controller, the interactor, the presenter, and the router. So the rest is reusable, the formatter, attributed string helper, the style guide. The views can be reusable, but the router and the, yeah, the VIPR is... Uh, for each scene specific. Um, having it this way in every scene makes it very easy to step into somebody else's code. Everything is structured the same way. This goes for all structures you pick, of course, but it used to be different. Every page 
had a slightly different way of handling things and it's annoying because before you can start on somebody else's code, you first have to go through a lot of learning and it's become much easier now. So that's a, that's a big help. And on top of that, um, it's very clear what functionality is where. Um, and it's very testable because everything uh, runs with protocols. Uh, so the interactor has its protocol, presenter, view controller, and uh, that means that all the components can be mocked uh, through the constructor, which means you can test them with unit tests. So they are very nice components uh, that do their own thing. You can test input, output. Um, yeah, this works very well for us, actually. But we're not there yet. We are still in custom God framework hell. <laughs> uh, so how do we get there? We can't just go on the water. Features need to be delivered. There are uh, desired functionalities. There are uh, marketing events. So we have to keep on going. So how do we get where we want to be? There were a couple of issues for us specifically. Uh, the navigation that we were using, there was, there was some added functions to the basic UI kit of, um, components that only accepted subclasses of the God UI view controller. So we could not have a view controller that did not apply that class. So we needed to fix that. Um, basically, we wanted to redo our entire stack. As you saw, it's totally different. The network layer is different. The scenes are different. Everything is different. So from top to bottom, uh, everything is to be rewritten. Uh, we wanted to change testing. Uh, we did not want to use anything old, Objective-C, from the Swift, the new Swift code, because otherwise you never get rid of it. We wanted to get rid of old Objective-C code. Uh, we did not want to have to rewrite all the old Objective-C code. Um, and yeah, we wanted to be rid of the Objective-C code as fast as possible. So how do we do that? We created our new, like I said, our new custom navigation, uh, which accepts both the old view controllers and the new view controllers. Pretty much it just accepts UI view controllers, which is both the old one and the new one. Um, oh yeah, I drew an image. I'll go through the points first. Um, the idea was to implement one new uh, stack and then just repeat that process. So the first one is the hardest, obviously, because you run into, oh, we don't have the color guide, oh, we don't have the font guide, we don't have the button, we don't have anything. Um, but once you have one, few, one, one full stack, so the network calls and the scene, then pretty much you have your basic stuff going and then it goes much faster, so the curve goes Lots of work, little work. Well, it goes faster and faster. Uh, we tried uh, test-driven development. Some of us liked it, some of us didn't. So some of us started writing tests and then implementation. Some of us started with the implementation and then wrote the tests. Whichever works for the individual works really, as long as everything is tested. In Xcode, you can see um, if the code is hit by the test. So if it's hit, it's hit. Um, we created some protocols with uh, temporary implementations to forward um, functionality to the Objective-C code because we couldn't do everything at once. So we were still using old business logic in the new Swift uh, code, but we didn't want to be held back by the architecture of the old stuff. So we made a protocol like how do we want it to work and then everything was forwarded to the old. Um, and, oh yeah, so uh, we instantly deprecated all our old code, said uh, only if there's, a, a, if there's a small bug or a very uh, critical bug, we will fix it. But if so much as a button needs to be added, we will rewrite the whole page in Swift. Um, because, yes, yeah, pretty much the only way to get rid of it, really. If you keep maintaining it, it's very difficult to get rid of. And maintaining it is very cumbersome in the old architecture. So it's, you know, you're spending a lot of time for something you don't want. It's illustrated in this image kind of. So the stuff on the left is old with a tape around it, deprecated. Uh, the fat ass framework, BM Commons, it's called uh, in the bottom. The dotted boxes are the, the old. Oh yeah, I didn't put that in the list. Um, we didn't want to change the Objective-C code much. The Objective-C code was using some business logic services, uh, so local services, 
and we didn't want uh, all Objective-C to start using Swift, so it just kept doing the same calls to the old business logic. We hollowed it out, the old business logic, and forwarded everything to the new implementation in Swift, so we didn't have to rewrite everything in Objective-C. So yeah, it's pretty much summarized here, and everything hooks up into the new navigation. All the views are rewritten. Nice. Results. Um, we've been at it for a year, pretty much. I think we started in October last year. Uh, in that time, we have implemented the new custom navigation. So we wrote our own navigation, a stack navigation, like UA navigation controller, tab bar, and modal view controllers as well, because the default UI kit modal view controllers uh, modal presentation logic is all right, but we needed more, so we created our own. Uh, we had our own custom alerts as well, so pretty much all the basic stuff. Um, all the major business, business logic components have been refactored, so list manager, order manager, all that stuff is now in Swift. Pretty much around 50%, I think, the view controllers have been rewritten in one year, pretty, only because we touched them. So we're going through the app like this and that, add this here, remove this there, add a new one, remove an old one. Uh, everything we wrote is unit tested. We have more velocity, more happiness, less learning curve for new developers, less bugs all out because it's just easier to work with. So it's much easier to know what you're doing. And yeah, during that we have still been developing new features. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy about it actually. And I think everybody has been a, a lot happier uh, with the result, easier to work with. Great results, great success. <laughs> that concludes my talk. Are there any questions? Yes. You mentioned the snapshot testing. Yes. Uh, can you more about that? Of course. Um, at the time, it was a framework from Facebook. Now it's Uber, I think. I'm looking at my colleagues. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Uber. Um, it's open source. Uh, there's a, um, a pod for it, CocoaPod. So you still use the Pegasus? Uh, sure, it gives some problems. Um, sometimes the, the colors change slightly. With a new iOS version, they kind of change the color palette or something. And for the, for the naked eye, it's not seeable. But if you have a, a zero tolerance uh, check, so there's, there's, there's no color difference or pixel difference allowed, then sometimes it will give errors. And you have to refresh all your snapshots, just redo them. Uh, but if you have put them to 0.1% difference, something like that, then it's good. So, yeah, you know, it's image comparison, so you're going to run into some things. Um, but usually it works very good. Um, and it's very easy, very uh, um, uh, solid. So not many false positives. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> oh, no power. Does that uh, answer your question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, like you said, like when you're touching something that succeeds with the width and so on. Yeah. But uh, you would also touch something that will inherit like all your classes if you rewrite all of them. Um, <laughs> we pretty much uh, just abandoned the whole inheritance thing. So we just rewrote the functionality. Um, we abandoned inheritance altogether as much as possible, obviously. So every time someone proposes inheritance, they have to have a really good case and have a presentation and uh, give us beer and everything, and then, okay, it's good. <laughs> so it's, it's frowned upon, um, but sometimes you have to. But so, we, yeah, we, uh, we rewrite functionality in the, the new architecture. So, yeah, everything. Uh, so you would keep the old ones if yeah. they were still being used by someone? Definitely. You only rewrite the ones that you need right now. Yeah, definitely. So, for example, the, one, the example I had with uh, very many inheritance, uh, if we would rewrite that list controller, we haven't yet, we would just rewrite it and leave everything old there. And everything that's not used anymore, we remove. But yeah, the, the God class and some subclasses of that are still used by other view controllers, so they remain until nothing uses it, and then off you go. Oh, yeah, I think you're, you're good. <laughs> Sorry. I got a stupid question. Uh, the, uh, use Enix or Storyboards? Because I do remember <laughs> the original presentation of Greenspeed. It had storyboards. storyboards. Indeed. Yeah. What is 
Uh, we do not use storyboards. Uh, yeah, we do not like storyboards. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 a little bit a matter of 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 taste, I think. But yeah, for us, it was uh, there were not enough advantages for the disadvantages. So obviously, it's good, it's nice to be able to make constraints visually. Um, but the downside is that you have merge conflicts and one large storyboard and well, there are a number of downsides. We decided not to, so we took the templates from CleanSwift and removed the storyboard bit and just made it with normal. So you have customized a little bit, a little bit, just the storyboard part. But most of it is uh, intact. But yeah. that was a good question. Do you have a, the application router, which is a, like a gun router? Um, we call it differently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, we, not really. We have an order state, uh, no, uh, an app state manager, and it's pretty much only for app-wide entrances. So, for example, the f if you force touch the icon on the springboard, there are a number of fast entries to the list, to the recipes, whatever. That's handled there. You have to handle it somewhere. Um, URLs are handled there. Yeah. So only, only there. Yeah. You kind of have to. Yes. Uh, one of the slides. Minimum reviewing, maximum coding? Yeah. Like reviewing the problem in the past? No, uh, well, um, it, it's about code reviewing, pull requests. Yeah. Um, it's obviously good to do that, especially um, uh, when there's new team members and everything. As to, and, you know, at some point, you're kind of, uh, if you're working together for a while, it becomes less necessary. But the thing was that because everything was so complex, and um, so diverse, every page was different and there was not really structure. It was very cumbersome to, to review and do pull requests. You would hit a lot of different classes because everything was with inheritance and it's difficult to see what's going on. So also when fixing bugs, it would take a day or two to get into the code and then, oh, that's the problem. Okay, trial and error a little bit because it's difficult to oversee and then the fix was pretty easy. So it's, it's more or less about that. We were, we were losing a lot of time reviewing. Yes? Uh, I see you prefix a lot with AA. Do you prefix all your classes with AA? That's for Objective-C. Mm -hmm. I left it in because that's to mark Objective-C. For Swift, we, in Swift, we have no prefix. No, it's just, we have a module, obviously. Oh, right. But uh, no prefix. No, yeah. Yes? Uh, there was another slide that emphasized adding variables to the code. Yeah. Could you expand on that? I didn't know what you were referring to. It was the counterpart of associated objects, so adding functionality through categories. Um, we, we use protocols now uh, with default implementation of the functions, uh, which is very powerful, but also very scary, uh, actually. We, um, learned that actually it's just multiple inheritance that I have reintroduced because not only can you um, provide default implementations for your protocol functions, but you can also just add functions um, and you can apply multiple protocols to one class. So it's multiple inheritance. And the, at, the, at the time we, uh, we ran into it, the compiler did not uh, notice name collisions so that gave some interesting bugs. Um, but that's not answering your question. Um, the, uh, variables on the protocol yeah. Can't be stored? No. Um, no, well, it's no. The thing is pretty much um, you add a variable in the protocol, you can't use them in the default implementation, but when you, well, you can actually. No, you can. You add a variable to the protocol, you apply the protocol to a class, and then you have to declare the variable in the class, and then it's added to the memory of that class. It's not available to the uh, both implementations. It is. That's the thing. Because yeah. you declare it in a protocol, but it's at that point not yet stored in memory. But when you apply the protocol to the object, to the class, that's when the memory slot is created. And you can use that in the default implementation. It works. It's nice, but it's, it's scary because it's, again, it's kind of like inheritance, so it has this. It, it, it's it's str it's more uh, more powerful, but also more scary, because there's less rules. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really like the the construct, 
but it's used with care. <laughs> yes? I was wondering if you have run in any, into any issues where you have a protocol default implementation that you want to override in some class. Or they run into issues with dynamic dispatch where you might expect your class's implementation or your struct's implementation to be called and actually it calls the protocol implementation or the other way around. Um, no. No, that, that's very well supported. Uh, I think that's the, the main idea of, uh, of default implementations. So you yeah, uh, it's great that if you have, for instance, I'm probably going to say this in the wrong order, but uh, it works like that a little bit. But if you have a function that takes, for instance, something, something protocol, and uh, you pass your struct to it that conforms to the protocol and has its own implementation, mm -hmm. uh, there's a good chance that instead of the implementation you have in your struct, that it will actually call the implementation you can have in your protocol. Because mm, the that's is like, oh, you're getting the, the type of the protocol from the other ah, one. Instead I, of the one you have in your class. No, I, don't, I think that works. I'm not 100% sure. But what I was talking about, if you have a class and you have two protocols, mm -hmm. and in both protocols you declare a function called run it. Yeah. And then you apply those both, both, of, both those protocols to one class. Mm -hmm. And then you call run it. Yeah. Which is it going to... The compiler doesn't say anything yeah. and it's, yeah. it's random. Well, I mean, it's kind of predictable. <laughs> ah, okay. I think for us it worked. We have uh, we have we have protocols with default implementations, and we use the protocol mm -hmm. everywhere. So uh, the protocol is the type of the of the parameter, and then when you call the function that has a default implementation, but the class overrides the default implementation, it will indeed use the class implementation as desired. In our case, that's what's desired. Because, yeah, the default implementation is just there in case you don't want to implement it. So, so find a case where it didn't work. I'm sure, yeah. I'll show you what Yeah, cool. Cool. That should be <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there still time? Sort of? Yes. What do you use to manage dependencies? Uh, CocoaPods still. Cocoa Pods. We were thinking about switching to Carthage. How many? Right? <laughs> It's not few, <laughs> yeah, 500. <laughs> not two hands. Uh, maybe two hands. Maybe two and a half hands. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. And so, then? Uh, I think because CocoaPods is less less supported. Uh, it's Ruby again. Uh, it's slow because of the master repo. And Carthus is pretty much what you want, right? It's just a GitHub repo. Check yeah, out. Really. I think, yeah, it's very pure. So, but yeah, we didn't make a change yet. Yes. I'd just like to say I'd like my client to use Carthage. <laughs> very good, very good. I just have to get it open. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Anyone else? All right, thanks. Yeah. <laughs>